In 2010, the BBC, in conjunction with the British Museum, produced a groundbreaking podcast series, A History of the World in 100 Objects. Through 100 highly engaging episodes, each focusing on a single object from human history, they tell the story of humanity. Central to the series is the idea that it is just one of the countless possible tellings of our shared story. I've been interested in the history of the web for many years. I've been privileged to have been invited to CERN twice now to work on projects associated with the earliest days of the web and started my own project some years ago to interactively document the web's history through major technology releases and cultural and intellectual milestones. But I've long been keen to try and tell the story of the web and its origins to an audience beyond professionals for whom the web is central to their working lives, about how it came together, how it evolved, and why perhaps it succeeded. I've thought of writing a history, doing a PhD, even once pitching a documentary series to a national broadcaster who didn't really see the appeal. And then, recently, while listening to A History of the World in 100 Objects, it occurred to me that that model might well work for telling the story of the web. A history of the web told through 100 pages. By telling the story of 100 influential pages in the web's history, out of the now half a trillion pages archived by the Wayback Machine, might we tell a meaningful history of the web? I quickly listed some pages that came to mind, some obvious, such as the first web page, and some now obscure, like boo.com, and realised that each page would have to serve as a kind of synecdoche, standing for a technology or whole class of websites. There would be printed pages amongst these 100s, like Vannevar Bush's seminal As We May Think from 1945, so often cited as the foundation for the idea of hypertext, of which the web is the most successful example. So today, you're the first, for better or for worse, to see the early fruits of this idea, which I hope may grow into something bigger. We're not going to cover all those 100 pages today, just a mere three, the final one being the first web page. Page one, as we may think. As the Second World War drew to a close in 1945, at least in a United States largely physically unscathed by the devastation that impacted Europe, Japan, the Soviet Union, Southeast Asia, and North Africa, people turned their mind to recovering from the war and returned to some sort of normality. In the century prior, the sum of human scientific knowledge had increased almost incalculably, only accelerated by the war, at least in areas related to the war effort, in physics, engineering, material sciences, chemistry, and mathematics. As director of the Office of Scientific Research and Development, Vannevar Bush had coordinated the activities of some 6,000 leading American scientists in the application of science to warfare and turned his mind in July of 1945 to the question, what are the scientists to do next? A key observation he made was that there was a growing mountain of research, but... The investigator is staggered by the findings and conclusions of thousands of other workers, conclusions which he cannot find time to grasp, much less to remember as they appear. The summation of human experience is being expanded at a prodigious rate, and the means we use for threading through the consequent maze to the momentarily important item is the same as we used in the days of square-rigged ships. What was to be done? That was the focus of Vannevar Bush's As We May Think, published in July of 1945 in The Atlantic magazine, a venerable publication which has, in recent years, returned to some prominence in public discourse and which is now owned, perhaps ironically, perhaps fittingly in some ways as we'll see, by Steve Jobs' widow, Lorraine Powell Jobs. Now, even a casual observer would notice that even if not aware of the exact date of the invention of the World Wide Web, it most certainly postdates 1945. 
So let me take a few liberties when it comes to using the word page in the history of the web, as when it comes to that history, these pages published in 1945 are as important as almost any of the now half a trillion or more that comprise the web in 2021. In them, Bush surveys the state of information recording and publishing, both as it was then and how he imagined it might be possible in the near future, with a curious and particular obsession for what he called dry photography. He imagined scientists, always using the masculine pronoun, wearing on his forehead a lump a little larger than a walnut. He takes pictures three millimetres square. As the scientist of the future moves about the laboratory or the field, every time he looks at something worthy of the record, he trips the shutter and in it goes, without even an audible click. Is this all fantastic? The only fantastic thing about it is the idea of making as many pictures as would result from its use. Bush's fantastical thinking continues. He imagines microphotography, the basic scheme of reducing the size of the record and examining it by a projection rather than directly. And consequently, a library of a million volumes could be compressed into one end of a desk. He discusses technologies like the voder and vocoder for converting speech to text and text to speech and imagines a future investigator in his laboratory. His hands are free and he is not anchored. As he moves about and observes, he photographs and comments. Time is automatically recorded to tie the two records together. But this and Bush's survey of the state of computing at the dawn of the digital era all would be but an amusing footnote to history if it not for where it leads. Consider, he continues, a future device for individual use, which is a sort of mechanized private file and library. It needs a name, and to coin one at random, Memix will do. A Memix is a device in which an individual stores all his books, records, and communications, and which is mechanized so that it may be consulted with exceeding speed and flexibility. It is an enlarged, intimate supplement to his memory. Now, things are becoming interesting, but Bush's ideas are far more ambitious than a personalized microfiche reader. Bush imagines what we might now call bookmarking. If the user wishes to consult a certain book, he taps its code on the keyboard and the title page of the book promptly appears before him, projected onto one of his viewing positions. And literally the home button. A special button transfers him immediately to the first page of the index. He imagines a kind of windowing system where the user can leave one item in position while he calls up another. But Bush still recognizes all this is conventional. However, it affords an immediate step, however, to associative indexing the basic idea of which is a provision whereby any item may be caused at will to select immediately and automatically another. This is the essential feature of the Memex. The process of tying two items together is the important thing. The process of tying two items together is the important thing. And here we have the spark of genius that two decades later, Ted Nelson will give a name to hypertext. From Nelson's brief words on the hypertext in 1963, Hypertext is a recent coinage. Hyper is used in the mathematical sense of extension and generality, as in hyperspace, hypercube, rather than the medical sense of excessive, hyperactivity. There is no implication about size. A hypertext could contain only 500 words or so. Hyper refers to structure and not size. Why is it that I've chosen to begin this history of the web with these pages from The Atlantic magazine in 1945? Because perhaps here, clearly, for the first time, someone imagines the essence of the idea that the web came to be built from. The idea of hypertext. Page two. Vague but exciting. In 1989, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, 
better known as CERN, had already been in existence for 35 years. Over that lifetime, as it had added newer and more complex accelerators, more and more people worked there, more and more data and knowledge were produced. But as CERN looked toward the future, and above all the planned Large Hadron Collider, which famously saw the Nobel Prize winning discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012, many saw problems with how the knowledge created was archived and retrieved. The high turnover of people, observed contract programmer at CERN Tim Berners-Lee at the time, led to information constantly being lost. The technical details of past projects were sometimes lost forever. Even where the information had been recorded, it just couldn't be found. In a previous stint working at CERN, Berners-Lee had developed Inquire, a hypertext program for knowledge management. On returning in 1984, Berners-Lee almost immediately started trying to get a hypertext project approved for official funding, and in March 1989 submitted Information Management, a proposal to Mike Sendel, his boss, who in keeping with his later characterization by Berners-Lee as the English gentleman, wrote in red ink at the top, vague but exciting. Sendel, whose small but vital role in the history of the web is not often recognised, sadly passed away in 1999. The vague but exciting annotation he added is well known, but less well so was his addition of, and now, to the page as well. And now indeed. While this document outlines in detail what would become the World Wide Web, The name Berners-Lee had in mind at the time was Mesh. The name The Information Mine, hmm, Tim, was also considered for the project. The word web does appear in this description of CERN's working structure. A multiply connected web whose interconnections evolve with time. This proposal became the World Wide Web. But how did a system for managing arcane information among the small esoteric field of high energy physicists become the foundation for a global web of interrelated documents and applications? Berners-Lee observed, The problems of information loss may be particularly acute at CERN, but in this case, as in certain others, CERN is a model in miniature of the rest of world in a few years' time. CERN meets now some problems which the rest of the world will have to face soon. Having gained Sendall's prescient approval and some budget, Berners-Lee, along with colleague Robert Callio, developed a far more detailed proposal, World Wide Web Proposal for a Hypertext Project, and that was submitted in November 1990. It outlined the architecture of the web a browser and a server, and a project to develop these at CERN. Work began on the original web browser, known as World Wide Web, though later renamed Nexus, on a Next computer, as well as the initial versions of HTML and HTTP, with early prototypes working by Christmas of 1990. It was announced to the world in August of 1991. Its success, now seemingly inevitable, was anything but a foregone conclusion. As Berners-Lee recalled in 1994 in his book, A Brief History of the Web, The next year or two required a certain amount of selling of the idea of the web to the High Energy Physics, or HEP, community. Even given that, Robert and I were taunted with the fact that W3's use in CERN itself was very low. The web's ultimate success has many parents, and no small amount of good luck. But one person does rise far above all others in the story, Tim Berners-Lee. With this page, Information Management, a proposal, he began the web's first chapter. Page three, the first web page. The WWW project merges the techniques of information retrieval and hypertext to make an easy but powerful global information system. The project started with the philosophy that much academic information should be freely available to anyone. It aims to allow information sharing within internationally dispersed teams and the dissemination of information by support groups. 
So begins the first public announcement of the web on a news group, which were like thriving internet-based communities in the pre-web era, alt.hypertext, where researchers and enthusiasts for all things hypertext congregated in the early 1990s. In the announcement, Tim Berners-Lee outlines his project. The WWW world consists of documents and links. A simple protocol, HTTP, is used to allow a program to request a keyword search by a remote information server. And he linked to what is not the very first web page, but certainly the first page on the web that was ever publicly linked to, a page which still exists, though it was updated for a year or so after its very initial publication. What can we learn about the web from this page? Before anything else, when you follow the link to it, we should marvel at something that may appear at first quite mundane. We are reading a document created at the very dawn of the web, and yet it works in our browser today. Which might not seem particularly exciting, but this level of backwards compatibility is breathtaking and a central feature of the web. Indeed, a founding principle of the web. Most of us will have had the experience of attempting to open an old word processing document with a newer version of the same software used to create it, only to lose formatting or even information. Or of attempting to run software no longer supported on our phone or computer, even though it's only a few years old at most. But here is a document created nearly 30 years ago, working in a browser on devices unimagined at the time. And this same backwards compatibility holds for just about any content developed for the web over those 30 years. Next, we have its content. Dull by today's standards, but recognizably the web, above all because of the web's distinct feature, the link. But at least for developers, the most interesting lessons from this first page come not from the surface, but what lies beneath, the source code. To anyone who's even passingly familiar with HTML, this will look both familiar and, well, a bit odd. What appears here as header would come to be known as the head, while the header element reappears nearly 20 years later in a different role as part of HTML5. The body, paragraphs, and headings like H1 are still part of HTML today, and links then as now are defined by anchor elements with an href attribute that specifies the destination of the link. Well, that next ID element was never part of any official HTML and was made obsolete not long after this time. But here in the very first web page is something still recognizable today to browsers as being close enough to modern HTML that they'll parse and render it and allow us to interact with its links. To a user, it's recognizable as a web page we can interact with. And to developers, the code we can make sense of. And this captures something essential to the web. One of its foundational principles is that of universality. The principle of universality allows the web to work no matter what hardware, software, network connection, or language you use and to handle information of all types and qualities. This principle guides web technology design. The question of why the web, among many open source and commercial competing hypertext systems succeeded is ultimately unanswerable. But this principle of universality encoded in the very name World Wide Web is surely part of that success. And as we see from this very first web page, this principle has been there from the very beginning. Mike Sendel appended and now to his more famous vague but exciting annotation to Tim Berners-Lee's initial proposal for what became the web. So what now for this presentation? Today, we've only had time to arrive at the very first web page, the very beginning of the web. And this among an estimated half a trillion pages that comprise the web 30 years after its launch. Each of those 500 billion pages tells a story, some grand, some tiny, 
And no one could ever hope to tell all of them, but they are all there, all interconnected. I hope over the coming months and possibly years to tell at least a few more of the stories associated with the most significant pages of the web's history. I hope so too you may be interested in hearing more of those stories. Please let me know if you are. I'd love to hear from you. But for now, I just want to thank you and to wish you all the best and hope you enjoy the rest of Web Stories. Thank you.